Good afternoon, Google I.O. <laughs> I did not expect that a talk on process would fill a room, capacity 300, with a line of people waiting outside. I am Rob. I hope you've been enjoying the, uh, the VR sessions at Google I.O. Together with Michael and Anshuman, we're going to be talking about VR design process. I know it sounds so exciting, right? We hope that this is a talk with a lot of practical advice for turning dreams into reality. So the talk is broken into three different sections, each focusing on a different set of practical advice that we hope will, hope will be useful for anyone who's doing VR design. Within the Daydream team, we use two separate but complementary design processes. This, um, each one takes a different approach, but helps us serve different needs. And the first one that I'll be talking about is our rapid prototyping process. It helps us explore terrain quickly, finding promising use cases, and testing a lot of ideas without wasting too much time on a highly structured process. We refer to the projects that fall into this category as daydream labs. After that, Michael's going to come to the stage, and he's going to be talking about our second process, a robust, iterative design flow that we use for building mature apps. He'll walk through the specific process that his team used in building our daydream homeworld. And to conclude the talk, Anshuman's going to come up and talk about an even more fundamental challenge that you're going to face when making VR apps, which is building your design team. So to give you an idea of where I'm going today, oh, oh before I, take, before I um, talk about rapid prototyping, I want to take a little bit of a step back to consider where VR is today and why we chose to put this talk together in the first place. So to give you an idea of where VR design is today, let's talk about platforms that most of us are more familiar with mobile, and web. In terms of things like hardware, design patterns, and the computational power that's available to us, virtual reality feels a little bit like designing for the web in the 90s. So to target the mid-range hardware, we had, design web we had to design web pages for monitors that had no more than 800 pixels across. Design patterns were just emerging, so we used things like the table element to outline everything on our page, because it was really all that we had. And to keep load time short, we had to worry about really simple things like image sizes. Like even something like a transparent PNG could just totally waste your, your download times. So with VR in its nascent stage, we're again having to pay very close attention to these three aspects. But unlike Web or Mobile, which took decades to mature, we really do believe that VR is set to mature much faster. For one thing, VR is a very open platform. And basically, from day one, it's open to third-party developers. Also, it already has this huge, generous community. And in fact, I recognize some faces in this audience from community members who have already been very generous with VR. And also, the underlying technology and workflows are rapidly maturing. I think that this conference is an example of that. We're doing uh, several talks on VR design process. So this is really promising as a designer. But there are still going to be a lot of challenges for VR design. Basically, basically everything is new. So first of all, UI standards and design patterns are just starting to take shape. And like I said, this is one of several talks where we're going to be sharing our best practices. And without the help of these established design patterns, we need a lot more explorations to find ideas worth pursuing. And once we've isolated a good idea, we need a lot more iteration to turn that idea, that gem, into a, a finished product. So due both to the number of iterations required and the number of disciplines and tools involved, we take more time uh, and more iterations to create a great VR experience compared with other digital media. So number two, head-mounted displays, or HMDs. These have their own unique design concerns that we've never really had to deal with before. So for one thing, VR devices, they obviously occlude the real world from us. And this forces us to pay attention to things like user safety, as well as physical comfort and also psychological comfort of the space that we've created for you. Next, we have to t consider totally new methods of interacting with our digital worlds. Now, even with the, the, the early stages of VR, we've seen a lot of different ways to use controllers to track your hands or to use something like, uh, like vision to track our hands to make our worlds interactive. So with all of this put together, the new hardware and design patterns mean that anyone working in VR is going to need to become familiar with a whole new set of skills, a whole new set of tools, a whole new set of workflows. For instance, Game design engines, or game engines, have become an invaluable part of our toolkit, right? Who would have guessed this? And later in the talk, Michael and Anshuman are going to dig into the specifics of the, of the skills that are used for VR design. Now, 
since we're working with all these new tools and skills and workflows, sometimes this means we need to build a new team. Sometimes the skills that we're looking for aren't satisfied by the people on our current team. So uh, we need all these members who can fill the multitude of, multitude of niches used to create a successful VR product. So all of this combined um, forced, us to forced us to develop a new design process that allows us to move quickly, to develop magical experiences for users and keep them safe and comfortable. Um, so now that you have a better feel for the challenges that we face as designers, let's kind of launch into our first big topic. Uh, so this is the rapid prototyping framework that we're using uh, for, for Daydream Labs. Uh, this was talked a little bit about more this morning. It was a 10 o'clock talk this morning about the findings in, our, in Daydream Labs. So for decades, science fiction has, has fed us these ideas about what might be possible in a future in VR. Some of these ideas hold real promise, but others, as it turns out, when we actually code them up and experience them, either they're a little underwhelming or the hardware just isn't there yet. So the nice thing is that with rapid prototyping, we can cover a huge amount of unexplored territory in a very short time, finding unexpected gems, and just as importantly, taking the, these ideas where the, that just aren't compelling or where the hardware isn't ready and setting those aside for later. So the, pro the process that I'm going to talk about today has been refined by a small team that's built more than 60 VR prototypes in less than a year's time. We work in teams of two, and we generally aim to release about one prototype per week. That's the goal. Uh, the teams are, broadly speaking, composed of one designer and one programmer, although we're really generalists with quite a broad array of kind of light skill sets. And Anshuman is going to be talking about more of that in his, his section about building a team. The projects that we choose span a huge breadth of categories. Some are really small and self-contained, like figuring out what makes for a comfortable reading experience, what size of text you should have, how bright should the background be, how, how much contrast do you need. Others are bigger and more featureful, like creating a system for authoring and editing layered animations on a timeline. So to help describe this rapid prototyping process that we're using within the Daydream team, I'm going to break it down into these five different steps. Brainstorming ideas, ranking those ideas, implementing them, sharing the results, and documenting the findings. So let's start with our first step, brainstorming the ide these ideas. So let's say you and your team have decided you want to make a gajillion VR prototypes. Where do you even go for those ideas? Good news here, everyone has an opinion on what would be awesome in VR. Go to that relative of yours who's like super bad with computers. They have an opinion on what they want to see in VR, I promise you. Getting input from a diverse team is a really huge help. If you have a team with a breadth of interests and a breadth of experiences, that's going to yield a breadth of interesting concepts for you to work on. So as you're thinking of these ideas, here are some creative exercises to go through. When, you're, uh, when possible, don't be incremental. There's no need to do that for these kinds of prototypes. Throw away all the assumptions and start from the ground up. The best new VR experiences aren't going to be derivatives. They're not going to be something that you've seen in, a, in another media platform just transferred over to, v, to VR. They're going to rethink everything and be cognizant of the strengths and weaknesses of VR in its current form. Next, it's really easy to be literal. People love playing with kittens. Let's make a VR space where you play with kittens. Like, this is virtual reality, people. We don't need to be constrained by the familiar. So let's make a world where you use your trebuchet to launch giant stuffed animals that are fetched by your T-Rex, right? Like, prototypes are a really great place to crank it to 11 and just see what happens. You don't know how far you can go until you've gone too far. Next, constraints are good. Now, this is a really weird one, and, and I want to dig into this a little bit. You don't want to over-specify the implementation de details for a team that's working on a project, but you do want to work with challenging constraints. So I think this, this quote from uh, Russian composer Igor Stravinsky is useful. He said, the more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself. And the arbitrariness of the constraint serves only to pr obtain precision of execution. All right, so this seems really strange. Let me give it, to kind of frame this, let me give you an example of a bad constraint versus a good constraint. A bad constraint might be something like, you have a, a team of 50 designers, and you put this task out to them, and you say, Create a classic board game in VR that feels exactly like the original. The problem with this is that it doesn't leave room for creative interpretation. So if you, if you give this task to 50 designers, you end up with 50 versions of checkers in VR. So let's turn this into a good constraint. Let's say you understand the strengths of VR. You want a game for two players that really leverages those strengths. So let's say the players have to face each other, that it shouldn't just be a tabletop game 
that you want the playing space to exist between the players in such a way that both players can interact with that space. And finally, it should be a game space that would be impossible to create in real life. Now, these are constraints where there's an enormous room for creative interpretation. And I promise you that if you give this task to 50 different developers, you're going to get 50 different totally awesome and unique games. Step two is ranking those ideas. So just because you're pursuing a lot of ideas doesn't mean that you can just like, skip the process of filtering them. And to give you an example of this, even though my team has created more than 60 prototypes, we've got way more than 100 in the queue waiting to be done. And at this point, in fact, ideas are coming into us from other teams faster than we can process them. So you need some way of choosing what the most promising ideas are. To do this, we pick a set of criteria that helps us evaluate and stack rank all of those ideas. Now, your team might have a totally different set of criteria, but these are some examples of ones that we found have been useful for us. First of all, try to think of ideas that are better or maybe even only possible in virtual reality. Ideally, something that's never been done before, something that has potential for real wow factor. Something that's a good fit for your team. And what's a good fit for your team isn't necessarily a good fit for every other team. What are you passionate about? What are your skills that you can leverage to make a great VR experience? Pick something that you can scope for a one-week sprint. And if the idea seems too big, think really strongly about what's your hypothesis that you want to test? How can you pare that big idea down into something a little bit more atomic? Finally, this isn't going to be for everybody, but for us, we're looking at ideas that are more than just pure entertainment. We know. For those of you who are in the game industry, you guys are going to make awesome stuff. We know that for sure. But we're kind of interested in education and productivity. We think that there are a lot of areas in VR that are just not even touched yet. Lots of room for opportunity. <clears throat> so this takes us to step three, implementation. This is kind of the meat of the, of the product here. Um, and as I mentioned before, our aim is for each team of two to finish a prototype in a week. But those prototypes aren't going to be useful if we don't go on to steps four and five, which are sharing and documentation. And that takes time, too. So realistically, we've got like three to four days at most to spend on implementation. And we're doing this week after week. So we hear this a lot. And I am going to be perfectly honest. I was, the, I was the guy who was really pushing for these one-week turnaround things, partly because I love game jams. But I was worried. I, I knew that this was going to be a problem. So, Let's put this in perspective. Who here has ever attended a game jam or a hackathon before? That is a really good number, more than I expected. So an on-site game jam usually lasts 48 hours. And if you're not familiar with them, if you haven't been, they are a totally amazing experience. They let you take a break from your regular work and create a playable, complete game in a weekend. And this is super empowering. It's like a total palate cleanser. So, I've attended about a dozen game jams, and I'm often teamed up with people who have never made games before, of varying levels of experience, and I have always had a working game at the end of two days. So for prototyping, you need to think about targeting the same scope that you would think about for a game jam, something that you could do in two days. When you take that scope and you stretch it out over five days, all of a sudden it doesn't feel so daunting anymore. It seems a little bit more realistic. Now, the other thing is that in the old days, like, Three to five years ago, we didn't have amazing game engines that are super accessible and easy to use and cheap. So it was really hard to get your hands on something that, were, that would let you like, get a good head start. So when I would go to game jams, I had to make games from scratch, like from C++ or C Sharp. We had to scope much smaller. So today, we have these, these amazing game engines that accelerate the development. We can do a lot more in a lot less time. Also, each of these game engines has an asset store, which is an amazing place for quick placeholder art. And some of the stuff is really good. So like, let's say I need my, my dinosaur model for my, my trebuchet stuffed animal fetching game. Boom, like two bucks, five stars, modeled, textured, skinned, animated, everything. You still have to be careful. Like knowing that you have all these things at your, resource, uh, at your hands uh, doesn't mean that you can get overly ambitious. You still need to keep it small. Um, think about what the absolute minimum is that you need to do to test your hypothesis. So some of you, especially who are you know, from around Silicon Valley, are thinking, OK, I got it. MVP, minimum viable product. I know what I need to create. Smaller, like way smaller than your minimum viable product. You want an experience that's just enough that you can like, walk another user through them while you're escorting them and say, don't press that button, because it's going to break everything. That's OK. That's enough to test your hypothesis. So another thing to be wary of is nerd sniping. Um, 
So, and I, I borrowed this term nerd sniping from an XKCD comic. If you don't know it, I, I recommend you look it up. It's what happens when you're presented with a problem that's just too fun and interesting for your brain to say no. On one hand, your desire to tackle these problems is what makes you a great designer or engineer. On the other hand, the problem comes when these fun, interesting sub-problems that aren't really essential pull you away from your core objective. So if you've already been completely distracted by this slide up here, then congratulations, you've been nerd sniped. <laughs> and if you're thinking about how you might design a framework to solve general problems of this category, um, google.com slash careers. <laughs> So let me give you a realistic example of nerd sniping. Let's say you're filling a world with a huge number of random objects. And so what you're doing is you're, you're randomly co coloring them just by picking like a random red, a random green, random blue, got your RGB color. And then you think, you know, this is kind of ugly, actually. And by applying just a little bit of color theory, I can make colors that are visually distinct but that look good in a palette together. You know, how much time could that possibly take? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. This is just distraction, distraction from your core objective, which is testing some other hypothesis that has nothing to do with color theory. When you graduate that idea from your one-week prototype into a full-fledged product, then you can talk about those sorts of features. Uh, and Michael's going to talk about that process a little bit later. And if you're still wondering about this nerd sniping and you've been obsessing over this the whole time, the answer is 14 seconds. So the next step is sharing. There's no sense in building prototypes that nobody else is going to see, which is why we're so excited to finally be sharing so many of these, uh, these prototypes with you here at Google I.O. Um, and what you need to do is have sharing built into your schedule. So what we do is have what we call a demo party every Monday afternoon where we invite our team members to come by and check out what we've done. We also invite everyone who attends these demo parties to leave at least one sticky note that says something they hate, something they love, some feature that this makes them think of that they would like to see in the future. It doesn't really matter as long as they give some piece of feedback. Also, these live demos have really helped validate the whole prototyping process. Having these small prototypes doesn't just ease development. These little bite-sized prototypes also seem to get the most useful feedback, which has been interesting. So this is a quote from one of the members of my team. He said, you build the tip of the iceberg, and people will come to you and describe the rest. And here's what we're finding is that if you show users a polished product, the feedback on that product focuses on things like subtleties of an animation or the color palette that you've used. They, they focus on the, the polish of the product itself. Whereas when you give them something that's clearly a prototype, a work in progress, or a vertical slice, users tend to give high-level feedback. They talk to you about features. It seems like something that's more malleable in their minds, and so they give feedback related to that. You know, you can also think of these prototypes from the perspective of diminishing returns. Maybe in a week, you can create something that feels like it's maybe like 80% complete. If you spent another week on that thing, it might feel more like 90% complete. And we find that having twice as many 80% complete prototypes gives us a lot more information than those 90% complete prototypes. All right, documentation. I know it's, it's, not, it's not, like, not like a fun word to see on a slide. But um, it's a really important step in the process, because if you don't, if you don't document what you've learned, again, you, it's really hard for you to have impact with these prototypes. Now, you don't want to get bogged down with documentation at the very start of the process, like with a heavy-handed design document. But if you're not documenting at the end, all these things are just going into the ether. You need for these, these projects to have impact and results. So for each prototype, we capture a 30-second video, we make a short animated GIF, we summarize our findings that, are, that, are, that came to us in all these sticky notes, and we send that out on email. And some of these prototypes are more fruitful than others, but we have never had a prototype where we didn't learn anything. In fact, sometimes our findings are completely unrelated to the thing that we thought we were testing. So I've got to admit it. I lied a little bit. I, I gave you like this, this really nice, clean five-step process that you can follow, which looks nothing like the reality of what we do. What we do is way messier. So while we do, in fact, try to have a demo party every Monday, there's no real clear boundary from where one process ends and the next process begins. At any given time, we're wrapping up ideas on a previous project, we're working on our next project, and we're, and we're like, thinking about ideas for future projects. So I want to give you a little bit more realistic peek into what the process actually looks like. So this is a week in the life of the Daydream team making Daydream Labs. So we start on Monday. For the previous week's party, or a previous week's project, 
We're, we're having our demo party to show off the prototype of what we've made. We're capturing the video of that, maybe with some, some users interacting with it, zipping up the project for sharing the code or sharing the build. Uh, for the current week's project, then, we're selecting a new idea. We're restricting its scope. We're looking at our various tech op uh, options, implementation options, what hardware we're going to implement on. For the three days in the middle of our work week, we are still summarizing and sharing the findings from the previous project. For this week's project, we get our first prototype working, and then we rethink, like, maybe we're going out of the wrong way, maybe we're testing the wrong thing, maybe we need to be asking different questions. So we recalibrate, we rescope, we look at our different features, we iterate on our core design. We're also spending this time during the middle of the week reaching out to, to members from other teams, because that's where a lot of our ideas are coming from. Friday, we're wrapping up the project for the current week, applying as much polish as we have time for, and narrowing out down our list of, of ideas for the following week. So with this schedule, that basically looks and feels like a permanent game jam, which I think is awesome. Um, but you really have to think, like, how do you prevent burnout with this like, constantly jamming? The first thing I've already said, scope for two days and stretch that out to five. And remember that you're not just implementing. You also need to save time for sharing, documenting, and preparing for future prototypes. But burnout can be caused by other things, like bureaucracy, or fighting an uphill battle, or having too many meetings. As much as possible, try to structure your process so that these just don't get in the way. And I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. It'll help if you can block time in your calendar, thinking about each of those five distinct steps of the process. Some tips for management. If you're managing a team that's doing this kind of prototyping, there's a place for passion. And if your team is really passionate about a particular idea, even if it seems like that idea might not be the perfect fit for the agenda that you're after, let them go with it. Passion can go a long way. Now, there are other dimensions of burnout, like creative drought. We were really worried about this. We thought we'd pick all the low-hanging fruit in the first month and we'd be done. This totally hasn't happened, as it turns out. There are so many ideas to pursue in VR. There is so much unexplored territory. Um, we started with a lot of our own ideas, but like I mentioned, other teams keep coming to us with new ideas all the time. And if this does become a problem, revisit those creative exercises that I list earlier. Um, ask other people for ideas. Try to constrain yourself to think up ideas, particularly in unexplored spaces in VR. Okay, so wow, you know, 60 prototypes. Um, when, you probably want to know, like, when are you going to see all these prototypes? I'm not going to tell you, but only because there was a talk earlier this morning that showed the findings from these prototypes. I've been told it's already on YouTube, so go and search for that. The topic is called Daydream Labs, Lessons Learned from VR Prototyping. And hopefully, just looking through those will really help spark some big ideas. But for now, rather than talking about findings, we're going to go back and focus on the design process. I'd like to introduce Michael to the stage, who's going to talk about a completely different but parallel design process. So while my team is looking at finding these gems, seeing what's interesting in VR, it's up to Michael's team to take these ideas and polish them into robust, beautiful, safe products. Michael. Thank you, Rob. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a designer and prototyper on the Daydream team. As you might have learned in earlier talks, designing for VR is unlike designing for any other platform. For starters, user behavior is very different. For example, your smartphone is largely an auxiliary device. It's best for short, frequent user sessions. But for VR, we have been observing session lengths of more than 30 minutes, with users spending even more time in higher quality content. Furthermore, since VR is immersive, use cases are very different. Snackable experiences are much less attractive in VR. Premium experiences are king. The process Rob shared is a great way of exploring the strengths of VR as a platform and will give you insights into the users for whom you're designing and the use cases you're fulfilling. Using the gems and insights gained from the Daydream Labs process, how do we move forward with designing a product from sketches to launch? I'll be giving you an inside look at how this process worked for us as we designed Daydream Home. Part of what makes designing for VR so difficult is that there are a multitude of new job functions, and within each function, there are many new skills. There are also a ton of new design considerations. With all of these factors and unknowns, how do we progress forward without getting stuck? While we were working on Daydream Home, we quickly realized that the process we were accustomed to following simply wouldn't work for us. And like many others, we first started out trying to use the tools that were familiar to us, Photoshop, Sketch. However, when we finally got our designs into VR, we realized that they simply didn't work. They were flat, the scale was off, and the whole thing was a little bit underwhelming. 
the new VR-specific design considerations were much more impactful than we had previously thought. And so we developed this new process with a focus on getting into VR as quickly as possible. This new process helped us design VR-first 3D user interfaces that felt native for the platform. They were immediately more inspiring than the UIs that we were designing with our past approach. And by getting into VR sooner during the process, we were able to avoid false positives. Issues with scale, obstruction, and comfort were easily avoided. For example, we briefly considered the idea of annotating virtual objects with captions. If you mock this out in 2D, it works perfectly. But the second you get it into VR, the whole idea completely falls apart. So what do we mean by getting into VR as quickly as possible? Since VR project needs will differ greatly from project to project, I'll be sharing how the process worked for our team as we designed Daydream Home. Here's a rough diagram of the Daydream Home design flow. This is in no way prescriptive. This process unraveled organically as needs changed from one iteration to the next. And as you can see, the process was flowing from interaction design. When I say interaction design, I include prototyping. The two are inseparable in VR. For other apps, it might not be the case that interaction design leads the design process. For example, some games might be entirely driven by environment design. But for us, the different project needs branched out from the progress that the interaction design team was making. The process helped us also develop a really healthy, positive feedback loop. Before we started jumping into VR as quickly as possible, we often found ourselves stuck in meeting rooms arguing about what is the best design solution. We quickly found that you cannot validate a design one way or the other without first prototyping it. So let's begin with the first iteration of interaction design. Knowing what users we were designing for and what use cases we were targeting, we began our design process much as we would on web or mobile with information architecture design. This gave us a framework on which to build, ensuring that our work would meet product goals and enable the end-to-end -end flows that our users would hope to accomplish. Next, we dive into the lowest fidelity of our design process, hand sketching. Hand sketching is the only 2D stage of our UI design process. We first tried creating mock-ups with applications like Photoshop, but we found it simply wasn't worth the time and effort. Hand sketching is the easiest way to draw out your 3D ideas. It's also the easiest way to share with your teammates what's in your imagination and to add on and build off of each other's sketches. Our next stage is what we call volumetric layouting. In this stage, we pull up our game engine and we start placing and scaling primitive objects like cubes to roughly match our favorite hand sketches. While we do this, we repeatedly check to see what it looks like in VR. During this stage, we get a sense of how our design plays out spatially. We can score, validate, and build off of our sketches with a better sense of scale, eye travel, head movement, and more. <clears throat> we instantly start getting more ideas about how we can design in more exciting ways that are only possible in VR. With a very rough layout, we start adding in UI objects like text, images, and interactive elements. We're careful to keep viewing our work in VR so that we can properly validate our design. For example, this image is just a flat render of the volumetric layout. In VR, the layout has a very nice looking depth, but VR also has a much smaller field of view in significant distortion. It looks something a little bit more like this. In this case, we find that we have overestimated the screen capabilities of the device. These discovery posters don't afford enough space for legible text. If we designed this in 2D, we would have never caught these issues. Attempting to solve this, we experiment more with positioning in Z-space. Orienting the contents of the UI around a cylinder help keep text legible, reduce distortion, and add interest to the design. While this wasn't enough to fix our text issues, it's a great example of how a VR-first design process can be a valuable asset. So in our next iteration of volumetric layouting, we increased legibility and decreased the size of the UI significantly. Large UIs in VR can feel uncomfortably claustrophobic, and if a UI takes up too much of your field of view, your eyes and head have to travel too much to see the various components of it. These are all issues that can only be caught when seeing your UI in VR. Volumetric layouting is a quick way of catching these. And as we progress through our design process, we begin adding in higher fidelity filler content. Things look good to us at this point, but we have questions that can only be answered with user testing. Meanwhile, our environment designer begins his work in parallel while we do user studies. Will users understand what the discovery windows are? 
Will they understand what the app icons are? Do they expect to be able to scroll either of these? And if so, how do they think they can scroll with the controller? We do a user study to answer these questions. The first round of research goes positively. Users understand what discovery posters are and what app icons are, but there's a little bit of confusion about scrolling. We validated our layout, and we've become more aware of the design challenges that we have ahead of us. Our environment designer then gives us a first draft of the environment. We incorporate this draft into our UI as quickly as possible. This way, we can be intentional when designing our UI within the environment. Our team feels comfortable moving forward. Now that we know the dimensions that we'd like for our discovery posters and icons, we deep dive into them. In parallel, we start engaging with 3D modeling. Now that the basics are locked down, we begin looking for moments of user delight. One of these moments is the discovery posters. What if these posters were less like posters and more like windows into different worlds? It could be a magical way of discovering new VR content. To dive into this area, we branch it off and we prototype it using what's called a stencil shader, which is like a revealing mask in an omnidirectional stereo image. An omnidirectional stereo image, or ODS for short, is a stereo panorama that's mapped onto a sphere. It is one of a few different ways of representing a 360-degree 3D photo in VR. Now, it's very important to carry all of your design ideas through to the prototyping stage for accurate validation. When we prototyped this idea, we were underwhelmed. The stereo was actually very hard to detect in the ODS through the discovery window. And worst of all, it used up a tremendous amount of memory. Viewing the windows side by side also gave this strange effect of three deep tunnels into three different worlds. And to add on to all of that, these images are a significant investment for developers to create. So we took another look at this idea, this time designing with performance as a primary design goal and adding in the additional requirement of elegantly flattening the world within the window when the window wasn't in use. We then investigated ways of achieving this design goal without an ODS we decided to prototype a system of layers of flat textures that could easily be created by developers in Photoshop. These layers were much more performant than the huge ODS images we were using before, and the depth effect could both be exaggerated and completely flattened when not in use. After we prototyped this idea, we really liked it. We, we improved the prototype by conservatively exaggerating the parallax effect. Parallax is one of the cues that the brain uses to perceive depth. The result is a truly magical experience to see in VR we found a great solution that people seem to love. If we didn't consider prototyping a first-class tool in our toolkit, this feature would have never been made a reality. Along the way, we've continued to make improvements in our environment, transitions, interactivity, and 3D models. At this point in the process, we begin supporting the engineering team with assets and working with them to find the minimum texture sizes we can use while still retaining a good-looking UI. We begin engaging our motion designer as we start iterating on our animations. Working collaboratively with the desire to tie our UI to our environment, we develop a wind metaphor for motion that ties our UI, environment, and animation together with a common theme. By working in parallel, we're able to improve collaboration across different skill categories. And as we continue to polish, we progress through our UI doing deep dives in its various elements. We push ourselves to utilize the benefits of having a rich 3D UI in a rich 3D system with lighting and materials. This is especially apparent as we design the hover effect for our icons. And as the motion design and interactivity come to life, sound design begins in parallel. And while we can't emphasize enough how important sound design is for VR, it began toward the end of our process so that our sound designer could have accurate timings for our animations. To learn more about sound in VR, check out the talk on spatial audio tomorrow at 9 AM. And surely enough, we come toward our refined design. This VR-first process enabled us to progress quickly. The process was very collaborative and used every single skill set that we mentioned earlier along the way. By making progress across multiple fronts per iteration, we were able to march toward refinement without getting stuck. We understand our specific workflow won't be applicable to all apps, but we hope you find the process we shared serves as a powerful tool to design in this new field of many unknowns. I hope that the two processes that Rob and I shared will be useful for your team. But a more fundamental challenge still remains. How do you build that team? To talk more about that, I'd like to invite Anshuman to the stage. Anshuman. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> uh, you know, designing the Daydream Home experience with Michael and several other really talented designers 
uh, was an intense collaborative effort. And I'm really happy that we could share our design process with you. And you could see how different designers came together and worked together to create that experience. Now, as you start building your own VR experiences from your rough ideas to finished products, one thing you will need for sure is a strong design team. My name is Anshuman Kumar, and uh, I'm a design lead on the Daydream team. And I'm going to be talking about building VR design teams. And uh, for the designers in the audience and those watching it online, if you want to start designing for VR towards the end of my session, I'm going to be sharing some tips that could help you get started. So with that, let's get rolling. Building a team is not very different from building a product. You have to start with a thoughtful intention. What kind of team do I want? What do I want my team to achieve? And when it comes to building VR design teams, we often struggle with these basic fundamental questions. Partially because a lot of us are new to VR, uh, but primarily because designing for VR is significantly different from designing for other mediums. Unlike web or mobile, where we used to spend a lot of our time designing flat UIs, for VR, we have to design a world with environments, lights, and sound, shadows, and motion. UI is just one uh, component of that world. Designing this world requires new design skills, different tools. It needs more time. And then we have to adapt our processes and workflows as the technology rapidly evolves. All these factors combined demand a VR design team that's different and unique. Well, successful VR design teams have three unique attributes. Number one, uh, designers wear multiple hats. No one in such teams are, is just an interaction de designer or just a 3D artist. Instead, you will find an interaction designer who is also good at 3D or a prototyper who has a keen eye for motion. Personally, as a designer, even though it might sound intimidating, wearing multiple hats is what makes designing for VR uh, so much fun. Then VR design teams are highly collaborative. Every advancement in VR technology is opening doors to endless possibilities of new interactions and uh, experiences. And the only way to explore them at speed and scale is to work together by sharing and learning from each other. And as Rob mentioned earlier, you know, his team explored new ideas every week by working together in small teams, focusing on the problem, and then sharing their learnings with the rest of the team and their demo parties. And finally, successful VR design teams, even though they celebrate diversity amongst their team members, they, they somehow don't let roles get in the way of getting things done. You know, so it's very rare to hear that, you know, I don't do this, this is someone else's job. Designers are very willing to get out of, out of their comfort zone and take on new challenges. But what are these skills that I'm talking about? What, are, what kind of skills are actually needed in a VR design team? A VR design team requires diverse skills. Uh, and depending on the product that you're building, these skills might change a little bit. But typically, a design team uh, which is building VR interfaces will require these skills. Now, a word of caution, some of these skills might see and look very familiar, but the applications are quite different. For example, while designing interactions, one, inter one has to additionally consider spatial organization and hierarchy, and use game engines to create volumetric layouts. For visual design, the concepts of grid and typography completely change as things are layered in different Z depths. Now, I do understand that if you're starting to build a new team, this might seem like a lot of skills to find. So in that case, I will suggest you to start with at least two designers. This will help them collaborate, bounce ideas off of each other, provide each other feedback, and solve problems faster when one of them gets stuck. Between these designers, you should have at least these three skills. Uh, if you recall the process diagram that Michael shared, 3D uh, design, prototyping, and interaction design were the fundamental skills. And frankly, you can't accomplish much without these fundamental skills. Other skills can be included at different phases of the project as the need arises. Now, you might be wondering, where are these designers with this multiple, who have multiple skills and can juggle between dif with different hats? Well, they're around you. There's a good chance that you might find a designer who's already uh, designing VR experiences and has these multiple skills. And if that happens, that's awesome. But if it doesn't, then you have to branch out and look out uh, and scout other design industries. We have noticed that designers building games have great 3D skills. 
They also have the experience of finding creative solutions to the strict performance requirements of VR. VFX designers are awesome at making things large, feel larger than life. If they have the experience with real-time graphics and some exposure to VR, they can be uh, of great value for your team. For designers from web and mobile, like designing information and creating fine and meaningful interaction is their bread and butter. If they additionally have 3D skills or VR prototyping skills, they can be great assets for your team. And don't forget, uh, there are a lot of students who are working on VR projects and design programs across the world. A thorough VR project done at school can give a student enough uh, domain experience to start working on a real product. So if you can guide them, they can be a great addition to your team. But these are all industries. Where do you actually go to find these designers? Well, I will say start with maker events like game jams and VR jams. There's, there's nothing better than seeing the designers in their element. And if you get a chance to jam with them, work with them on an idea, I mean, you, can, you can think of it like as, as speed dating in certain ways. Uh, in this process, you will learn uh, a lot more about these designers than you will ever learn through regular formal interviews. There's also a good chance that you can find such talent at conferences like this one and other tech events that uh, happen all around the globe. Uh, the fact that you're here, all of you, means that you share a common passion and common interest. And who knows, like someone sitting under this geodesic dome could be a future uh, colleague. And Lastly, social media can be surprisingly effective, but you need to go beyond the obvious mediums. Imagine, someone, uh, imagine watching someone on YouTube who is passionately presenting their VR demos. Or Twitch. Uh, a lot of designers have started using Twitch to live broadcast their creative process. Watching a designer walk you through the process of creating beautiful VR environments, you know, it will not only inform you about the subject, but will also help you find a great designer for your team. And of course, following people's work and honest opinions on Reddit and Twitter can definitely uh, reveal a lot about their passion and domain knowledge. So for those of you who are building design teams, here are some tips of uh, finding promising candidates. And those of you who are designers who want to join this team, this is uh, a good example of what these design leaders will be looking for. So as a de design leader, you would, be, you would come across stunning portfolios, beautiful renderings, and impressive uh, language. And all that is important. But you will additionally need to look for a few other things. One, has the person, make, has the person made anything in VR? Uh, and I'm not talking about a major project or years of industry experience. I'm talking about are they tinkering in VR? Are they making fun little small demos in their free time after their day job? This is very important, because if the answer is no, uh, then for a designer, learning new tools and working with new technology can be very stressful. And if, even as the team leader, it will become, a, uh, it will become difficult for you for, uh, helpful, to be helpful uh, in transitioning this designer as a VR uh, designer. And then uh, diverse skill sets. Uh, we have already talked about the importance of having multiple design skills as a designer can wear multiple hats when the need arises. And uh, it requires true passion to continue uh, learning new things every day and taking initiatives to explore new possibilities that are created. Now, if you find a designer with these skills, uh, I'll say uh, act fast and be flexible. Uh, and in a few days from now, if you forget everything I said, uh, just remember these four things. Build a culture where skills are valued more than roles. Build a culture where, uh, which encourages teams to share and learn from each other. Uh, keep an open mind for fresh talent, and you would be pleasantly surprised. And cast a wide net and, so that you can get new talent and build a more diverse team. And then, for some reason, if you don't want to build a full-blown team, then consider involving a design studio. There are several design studios across the world who are making great VR content. And if you want to know more about this, you can find me after this talk. And I really hope that this information helps you answer the question that we started with, what kind of team do I want to build? I also hope that this, uh, this information helps you build that strong design team. Now, this brings me to the last part of my presentation where I prompts to share some advice for designers who are interested in designing for VR. So I have two tips and one advice. Uh, tip number one, learn from your own experiences. 
Uh, if you're new to VR, get a cardboard, throw your phone in, try out as many VR apps as you can, keep a journal of your observations. Gradually, you'll start developing an eye for the nuances of VR. Uh, you'll start identifying what works, what doesn't work. And if you start feeling that urge to make things, then follow the second tip, which is learn the tools. As a VR designer, you might need to learn these three categories of tools. And if you're a designer, you only already know one of these. You need to focus on the remaining two. I would recommend you to start with a gaming engine. Uh, both Unity and Unreal are free, uh, and there are tons of online material that can help you get started. You know, it's very important to get comfortable with these tools, because this will let you focus your mind space on what to create and not on how to create. And lastly, I'll be honest, uh, you know, the learning curve is steep. You will need to be really passionate about VR and persistent to get over this learning curve. One thing that helps is being part of the VR community. It can give you enough support and inspiration to help you keep climbing up this learning curve. And hey, it might look like a tough climb, but the rewards uh, come very early, and they are very satisfying and fulfilling. So don't give up. With this. Uh, I'd like to conclude this session where we talked about process and team. And uh, uh, we, everyone, I feel, in this room is uh, uh, going to be a pioneer in VR as we start working and continue contributing to this uh, domain. And uh, we are really glad that uh, you have joined us on this journey. Thank you so much. <laughs>